folks and, and also professor. Uh, today it's part five. Now, previously, I spent some time discussing how to get ready for freelancing and how to locate your first client. Now, these are the things I spoke about in the previous section. So today, I am going to uh, speak about the next part. Now, I already spent sufficient amount of time explaining to you how to locate your first client, both conventional methods through the online platforms and also unconventional methods, like literally reaching out to your friends and neighbors and relatives and whatnot to get your first order. So we have discussed that now. Now, the next thing is, is the next part, which is whether it is unconventional methods that I spoke about or through the platform where you're applying for projects, you're bidding for projects. And now let's say out of 50 leads, out of 100 leads, now I think I talked about this before as well, the first client is gonna take a while. It could be many months. It could be, uh, you know, on, on Upwork or Fiverr, you'll have to apply for projects or apply to customer queries, maybe 10, 20, 30, 40. I do not know. It depends on the industry you are in and what is your skill level and stuff like that. Now, once you have survived that initial lengthy proposal applying part, let's say there are some people who are ready to talk to you. Okay, now today's session is going to focus on that. So you have managed to get some prospects. You know, in sales, we call, you know, a customer is somebody who's already buying things from you. A prospect is somebody who's thinking of buying things from you. So you may want to make a note of that, guys. As I told you already, every time, please keep a journal with you and in the session, make sure you have a pen, jot down the points and things like that, whatever you feel is necessary. Of course, the recording will be uploaded after the session is over, but still, it's good when you're making notes while it is happening live. So, prospect is the person who is about to talk to you, right? You know, it's like if you have a shop, like an ice cream shop, a parent and a kid walks in, they're just looking at the, you know, the ice cream shelf. You know, they, have, they, have, they haven't purchased anything yet. They may walk away, in which case, you know, that sale wasn't converted, but if they actually buy something, then that that is when they become a customer. So, prospect and customer. So today, I'm talking about like, okay, you did your marketing, you did your reaching out to people, and then somebody is now ready to talk to you. So that is your chance uh, because these are like your first client. Now, when I say first client, it doesn't actually mean the very first client. Think of it like a bunch of clients in the first year of your freelancing. So I would say everybody who you work with in the first year of freelancing would what I call a first client. And there are some specific things you need to do when you are dealing with this first batch of client. Okay, so that is what we are going to talk about uh, today. And that is the topic, my dear students. Uh, Professor, is that clear? So like what I am what I was done before, what I'm doing today, is that? Completely clear, yes. Okay, okay. Now, here, now this is now, why is this important? Why is this kind of the critical juncture? Because, uh, by now, I'm sure some of you have started getting your hands dirty with freelancing. Maybe some of you are following me along. We've been doing this for many weeks and months now, so some of you may have already created uh, accounts on the freelancing platform platforms. You may have started applying for projects, bidding for projects, and things like that. Now, you're already spending a lot of time and money. Now, if you don't find a client soon, what would happen is... Well, you know, it's like anything else. Like, it's like you're trying to climb a mountain or something. At some point, some of you will eventually give up. Okay, it doesn't mean you're a quitter. I mean, ultimately, everybody has their own priorities. Uh, okay, so you, this is where you decide if you're going to stay and make some money with it. You know, perhaps, like, for example, I told you guys, I'm a full-time freelancer. So I'm not doing this as a side hustle. This is my hustle. So this is my life. Freelancing is my life, Okay. So, so you maybe this will become like a career for you, like how it has become to me, or maybe you already have a job or you plan to get a job eventually and you're going to keep this as a side hustle. So it's an important decision that's going to happen for you. So you can either stay and make it happen or you're going to quit. So that is why the first batch of clients is so important. Now, in this regard, what really matters is I have one word for you and then we're going to talk a lot about this is portfolio. 
okay? Now, it, depending on which industry you're trying to go with, the portfolio, uh, the meaning of it really changes. So I'm gonna use uh, uh, some of the, uh, mostly from my own experience, what I mean by portfolio and how uh, this will help you land your first client. Okay, now imagine this. Okay, now what is the uh, thing that anybody will ask you when you're new to freelancing? They're the first question they'll probably ask you is, hey, Jay, you know what? I like your style. I seen your photo. I seen your online account. Everything seems to be in place. Now I'm talking to you, but my friend, you don't have any experience. You know, clients are very forthcoming about this because you may be new, but clients are rarely new. You know, your customers are rarely new. They've already been buying these services from other providers for many, many years. So for example, I do tutoring. So when I speak to a parent or a student, they have already dealt with tutors either at their school or locally or online. So when I am new, it doesn't mean the customer is new. A lot of times customers already have a good idea on how to deal with freelancers. Okay, so this is something I want all of you to understand. Just because you are new doesn't mean your customer is very rare that you actually meet a customer who does not know what he or she wants. That never happens. Okay, so they will always know what they want. And the first question they'll ask is, Jay, I like you, my friend, but you don't have any experience. Your Upwork account is new. Your Fiverr account is new. Your LinkedIn is empty. Everything is empty. You don't have any customer reference. You don't have any customer reviews. Okay, that is what we are trying to fix here. Now, it, this is what is called as a, a catch 22. You can't get experience until somebody hires you, but nobody will hire you because you don't have experience. Okay, so this is the catch 22 that you deal with when you're trying to deal with your first batch of customers. Now, there's nothing we can do about it, but try to find alternatives which will give you a impression of experience. So that is where the portfolio comes into picture, okay? So now what, what did I do then? When I was new, what did I do? So let me show and talk, my dear students. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop, pause my sharing of my PPT for a minute here, so hold on a bit. So let me go ahead and bring up something else. Okay, hold on. So let me show my portfolio and then explain how I normally go ahead and try to impress my clients. And, and also please remember that this portfolio is something that's going to stay with you for the rest of your life. So what you do today in the beginning to impress your first client, you can keep repeating it over time to improve your future clients as well. And I'll tell you something, a lot of freelancers don't seem to think about this, but there is such a thing called as economics and there is such a thing called as inflation, okay? Every freelancer should read about the basics of economics, any book on economics or just watch some YouTube video or anything like that. So a lot of freelancers don't realize that every year, if you if you're unable to raise your prices or convince people to increase your prices, you're actually making less money. So inflation is a real thing. So again, what really helps you ask for improvements in prices or ask for more money and get better clients, it's not just experience, it's actually a portfolio that really pushes you forward as your career grows. So let me go ahead and bring up my own portfolio, guys. So let me start with my coding thing. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen again, hold on. Just loading on my screen, one second. Okay, let's resume the sharing here, please. Okay, here we go. Okay, on my screen right now, you'll see something which is probably familiar to the old timers. I've been doing the sessions for some time now for AIU. So this is my GitHub account. You can see there, there are a couple of things going on here. And the GitHub thing is one of the first portfolio things I worked on when I was beginning as a freelancer. It goes a long way in impressing my potential clients, okay? Now, before I continue, Professor, are you following along, sir? You know, you're the proxy for my audience here. So that, so far, does it make sense? Yes, it does. I am following okay. along. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Uh, so what is happening here, folks? Now, I am in the IT 
industry. I mean, of course, I have, you know, for the last few years, I've been diversifying to, you know, consultancy and things like that, but this still remains my bread and butter. So GitHub, for those of you who want to get into the coding industry, GitHub is kind of like your developer passport, okay? Now, if you go back to the AI YouTube channel, uh, you know, you'll find a lot of videos we've already done on coding and GitHub, so you may want to you know, check that out after the class, right? So what is happening is you'll see that obviously I have, you know, like on the, uh, you see a lot of green dots. I'm going to draw your attention to that. Let me just get my marker here. See these green dots on GitHub. Okay. And I'm sure many of you are in the IT industry in the audience right now. Uh, so these green dots represents the amount of coding I have done in the last one year. You can see here that the contribution starts in November and this is the end of, a, again, it's November. So it's a 12 month, uh, like a bird's eye view of the stuff that I have done. So every time I meet a client, the first thing I tell them is, you know what guys, you're trying to hire me as a coding tutor or a coding consultant or a bootcamp consultant or a curriculum designer or just a guy like who's talking in a session like this. Check out my GitHub is what I always say because that is proof and that proof cannot be faked. Okay, now the green dots represent work, some work, you know, it doesn't, I don't know what work it is. It doesn't mean that it's a good work or bad work. It shows that you've done something. So every day, pretty much every day, you can see there are some gaps here. Those are the days I was either sick or I was on vacation or just chilling out. So, but still the green dots are plenty. Sometimes it is dark green, light green. So dark green means I obviously worked a lot on those days. Um, Professor Lambert, yes, sir. Yes, I have a question, Jay. Um, yes. If somebody doesn't actually do work, I'm thinking that the best way to actually show their experience is to get like a professional web page or a professional blog and keep writing about what they're doing and projects that they're studying and working on and different examples of their work. So even though they're not working, they're still showing this track record of, of, of what they do. Uh, that is absolutely right, Professor. I was going to uh, bring that up in the next slide, sir. So you are, oh, you're, we are thinking there. Yes, sir. We are thinking there. Okay. Yes, sir. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. So I'm just putting the foundation here, Professor, before I move on to those things. Yes. All right. Sir. Yes. So, uh, guys, as the Professor mentioned, uh, there are additional things you have to do, but I'm just putting the foundation here from a, a software perspective. So, step number one, they see this. Any client, you know, they see this, you know, as I told you, clients usually already have an idea what they want. So when they see a guy with, with contributions like this, they know that he is doing something. He's a guy who's been working hard. Sure, he's new to the industry, but that hasn't stopped him from racking up some experience of his own. Maybe not for clients, but maybe he's working on some demo projects or he's just upskilling himself and so on and so forth. And also there are a lot of other things going on here. You know, I got some badges and achievements and stuff like that. I have some uh, graph things going on here. I have some coding repositories with some stars and other things going on here. So what is happening here, my dear students? So this is what I call a portfolio. And this does not depend on you having an actual client. Now, these are things anybody can do, okay, with or without any customers. So while you're sitting idle, applying for jobs, reaching out to people, doing your marketing and all those activities, you also sit down and work on your portfolio and it starts racking up, it starts adding up. So which means when you meet a client, you, you may be new to the industry. You never worked with a client before. You can be honest about it. I, I've seen some freelancers, they try to pretend as if they have some clients and stuff like that. I'm not a big fan of that approach because usually there'll always be one client who will be like, okay, give me some references. You know, as I said, you know, business is business. They want validation. They want proof. Sometimes they will even ask you for receipts and uh, tax returns, you know. So uh, you lying is usually not a good idea, guys. So I don't really like to go down that route, even if you can uh, source fake documents and stuff like that, you will eventually get caught. And the worst part is you always seem to get caught when you are on a roll. So you don't want to do that. So try to avoid, you know, doing any fake things. So focus on being real. If you don't have any clients, just tell the customer that you don't have a client, but you're not sitting idle. So that's what a portfolio does that for you. Okay. So in a coding thing, this is what you would do. Okay, now 
if you are in some other industry, let me go back to my slides here. Let me just come out of this. Now, this one is only applicable for the software thing, but what if it is something else? So again, you build your portfolio wherever you are trying to get the work in. I'll give you one more example, actually. But before I do that, I want to move on to the next slide here. So let me come out of this. Let me erase all these things. Uh, hold on, guys. Uh, there we go. Let me stop sharing. Oh, hold on. I don't need to stop anything. I just need to switch over to the PowerPoint. One second. Ah, okay. Let's resume the slideshow. Yes, we are back. So this is what I mean. I want to show you that example of a portfolio. So now I'll come to this update schedule. Now what I'm trying to say is now this is the thing which professor was talking about. I was going to talk about it at the end, but I think since the topic has come up, I'll mention it right now. Now, along with your portfolio, in my case, the coding portfolio, I remember in the very early, early days, now these days, my GitHub alone is sufficient for me to impress my customers because I have reviews and references and all that. But like the professor said, guys, I remember back in 2012, when I was just starting, I would build a new website because I was trying to become a website freelancer, right? So I... I would build a lot of websites almost every week. So I was trying to do a lot of uh, bootstrap websites, WordPress websites, and things like that. So what I would do is I'd build a new website every week, even if I have zero clients, because you know building and running a website doesn't cost any money. Most of it is free in the technology world. So I would just keep building websites and just keep adding stuff. Okay, so that will also definitely help you when you're trying to build your portfolio. Now, what are the other things you can do to build your portfolio? And many of these things I myself have done. Even today, I do it. Now, this is something I want to mention, folks. Okay, I'm going back and forth in the slide because these things are not linear. You know, they kind of stack on top of each other. This is, again, remember your pen and paper. Remember what I talked about Trello. I think Professor Lambert will remember. I, I talked about Trello for a couple of sessions. Uh, guys, building and updating and schedule, okay? Go back to that video. Trello is how I'm able to make a, 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 a decent amount of money because I'm so on time with the schedule and everything, okay? So you want to make a schedule for every month, every year, what portfolio is being done, what is going to be updated, what is going to be deleted, what is going to be added, and stuff like that. Now, why would you even need a schedule if you're only going one thing or something? See, that's not how it works. Okay, now I'm gonna give you one more example. And this is actually an interesting story because of something good that happened to me this year. So I think you guys will find it very relevant. So let me once again, go back to my computer here and let me go back to this one. Uh, so let's say, uh, hold on. So here, okay, now what I did was um, I was trying, I'm trying to become, well, I think I have already become, but I'm trying to become a, what is called as a, a video vendor. Okay. Now what I did was last year, uh, this is my channel. You can see there, it's called jazz coding channel. I'm just going to show it to you. There you okay. go. This is Jay, oh, that's me again. I, I was a little bit younger last year. So there you go, guys. So this is my coding channel, YouTube channel. And if I go here, and uh, you'll see that I have put a lot of videos. Professor, are you able to see that, Professor? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, okay, perfect, perfect. So now I, I want to, again, there's another example of a portfolio, my dear student. So what I'm trying to do is I, I realize that a lot of people find, uh, you know, my, my voice, my way of presenting and things like that. Very interesting way of explaining things. So I, I, I decided, okay, I'm going to become a, a video vendor of coding tutorials. So I want to get into that business. Now, again, now here, even though I am an experienced freelancer, I am new to the video tutorial industry, okay? Now then I realized, okay, what am I gonna do? Now when I meet a client who is looking for tutorial videos, yes, he realizes that I'm an established freelancer. I got all that Microsoft award and everything. You know, I have the reviews, the recommendations, but I've never worked on video content. So that's always a question mark. Like I said, clients always know what you're talking about and clients always know 
what they want. So what I did was I sat down, you know, this video vendor business is very, very expensive. It's kind of, you need to purchase expensive computers. You need to learn video editing. You need to build a video studio. I did all that. It cost me thousands of dollars. And then I sat down and I started making these videos. A 30 minute video can take up to a day to record, edit, produce, and upload. And I, you see all these videos, each of them took a, a day on an average. So when I say building a portfolio, I am not messing around, okay? So I am never messing around when I talk about these stuff. So these are things I have done myself. And you know what, guys, you know, uh, it, it, this is one of the stories which has a happy ending because some guy actually saw my YouTube channel and, and he became my investor professor. I'm very happy to say professor that he became my investor. He liked my idea. And uh, we, in fact, I, in fact, became a co-founder of the company and we are opening a video vending shop. Uh, it should be opening in the next couple of months, professor. So again, guys, so what was supposed to be just a freelancing idea uh, became a, a business. Uh, professor, you want to say something? Yes, sir. That, that, do, you, do you ever see the Khan Academy? I've heard about them. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, I've heard he, about he just them. started out by by creating all these little videos about how to teach there you go, yes. and physics and chemistry. And all of a sudden, Bill Gates found him and created and said, let's go with big. And there you go, professor. There you go. So, so, so nothing that big, professor, but something similar, but on a very small scale, just enough to exactly. make you happy. You're, you're, so, you're connecting, you're, you're presenting yourself. He, he, he yes, have, I don't even know if he had a, he had a job in Silicon Valley, but he did this on the side, just in his free time, he would make little videos and then write them out. And I, I, I loved his videos. I would study some of his videos because it, it was very well explained. And so if you, oh. if, you just, if you just get on social media and start presenting your knowledge, people will find you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So th there you go, my dear students. So that's exactly what I'm talking about. So I built these videos and then now I actually not, it was, I mean, I was really just planning to make some small amount of money as a freelancer who supplies videos, but now I'm, I actually own a company that makes these videos with a studio, with funding, with a team I'm actually hiring right now. So this is what I'm talking about guys. So, so again, anything you want to do. So if you want to become a video vendor, build a YouTube channel. If you want to become an audio vendor, you know, again, voice recording, then go ahead, set up a podcast. Okay, there's a website called SoundCloud. Go there, upload your recording, upload your music. Okay, if you're an artist, there's a website called ArtStation. I want to show that right now, Professor, but the ArtStation website is art. You know, some of it is not safe for work, so I'm not going to open that. Uh, so again, if you're an artist, then set up an account on ArtStation. If you're a photographer, set up an account on Behance or something like that. So guys, this is exactly my point. So going back to my PowerPoint, when you are approaching your first client, you know, continuing from what we discussed in the previous session, it's all about building your portfolio because that is under your control. You may never have a customer. You may not have a customer, but nothing is stopping you from building a portfolio. But yes, you know, before you make money, you got to spend it. Okay. So I, I always ask my freelancer, you know, like, and I also do private consulting and stuff like that. Why I always tell people your first freelancing job should be something that you can do with your current expenses. Okay. Because like the video vendor thing, I was only able to do it because I had a few, you know, thousands of dollars just sitting as a budgeted and ready to spend on the studio. So I was only able to do that because I had that kind of money. You know, those computers cost a lot of money. Those electricity costs a lot of money. Those large monitors. Uh, Professor, I think some microphone thing is going on. So let me just try to. Oh, 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 oh. I removed that option, Professor. Okay, yeah. I found the microphone and I muted it. Oh, thank you, Professor. Yes, sir. So, so this is what I'm talking about, my dear students. So, you, you know, whatever freelancing you're trying to get into, okay? So if you want to become a video vendor, you must ask yourself, do you have the facilities and the money to buy and make the kind of things 
that you want to showcase. So if let's say if I want to become a video vendor 10 years ago, I, that was impossible. I didn't have anything. I didn't even have a computer when I got into the coding business. I had to borrow it from somebody before I could buy my own computer. So, so you please do your freelancing planning according to the facilities you already have because with our portfolio, it's impossible to convince customers, okay? So try to remember that. So your portfolio and then your freelancing work should really be things that you can do within your budget. So like, for example, I see somebody's asking questions about an art studio. So the question is, if you're gonna become an art studio, do you already have the necessary facilities to build the art portfolio and keep making new art because you don't have any clients that it may take three months, it may take six months, it may take a year, and you need to keep building this and it should not be a drain on your resources because by the time you get your first client, if you become bankrupt and then you close shop and then customers start showing up at your doorstep, that's not gonna help you, is it? Because you already wrapped everything up. You spent six months, you spent all that money, and now the customer is ready to hire you, but you have shut down your shop. So you should it should not happen that way. So please choose your line of work plus the activities like portfolio building, depending on how much amount of money you already have. And, and, and this is where, uh, Professor Lambert, I want to kind of mention, um, for those who are starting new, I would recommend you focus on such kind of freelancing uh, that can be done from a single laptop. Because you it's easier to buy, okay? You know, you don't need a studio or a dedicated workspace or something like that. Okay, so you can focus, you can limit your expenses, keep building your portfolio. And then once you start getting some customers, then you can maybe upgrade and so on and so forth. Like when I started, the reason why I chose software development as my choice of freelancing, because one, I was already very poor back then, so I couldn't buy or anything like that. Uh, but the important thing is I knew software is something that can be done even on an old computer, you know? So, I mean, of course, I eventually, I, I think I told this story before I begged, borrowed, I bought everything new. I, I talked about it in the previous episode, but the, the point is try to do things which are within your budget. Okay, they're very important in the early days of your uh, portfolio uh, building. So that is something I want to mention here. Now, before I move on to the next topic, Professor, which is the uh, you know learning and building plus social media, any questions or something, some thoughts there? Professor Lambert, I'm gonna drink some water as well. Why do you do that? You know, I put up some links to Discord. Discord is like this other, you know, group of, of, of websites that actually help people get come together, talk, share ideas. There's tutoring Discord groups. There's all kinds of Discord groups. Yes, sir. Yes, what, do you, sir. What, what do you say about that? Uh, so they are very useful. So like I, you know, there was a time when I used to uh, frequently visit and I, I have had my own Discord as well uh, for a specific project and things like that. They are a great way to get some questions answered and meet other people like you and help you and build that networking thing I mentioned before. So that is an excellent idea, Professor. Yes, sir. Um, let's see, there's a question here from, who was it, Martha? I'm a health writer and wellness coach. Which websites are best for my work? Uh, Professor Lambert, is that okay if we, if we do the question thing at the end, sir? Because I, I just want to Absol finish the question. Absolutely, go ahead. Yes, Hold sir, your yes, sir. Because the last Hold question is, I don't have a quick answer, so I'm going to think about it, so I don't want to break the flow here. Yes, sir. I understand. Yes, okay, sir. So okay, we'll, all right. We'll, we'll, you can write your questions into chat, but we'll save them until after the presentation. Okay, perfect. All right, guys, so moving on for the next 10, 15 minutes, the last two things I want to talk about is the, you know, again, we already touched upon it, but I'm coming back. I'm kind of bouncing between topics here. So is that social media, YouTube, blogs, and dedicated communities, plus learning and building. Now, these two things, my dear students, go hand in hand. And this is where you'll have to go back and start using something like a planner, like the Trello thing we talked about already. The good thing is, Professor, because you've done so many sessions, I'm able to kind of link up with what I'm doing today with the previous sessions, so the students have that extra knowledge and stuff like that. So that is really helpful, sir. So, so coming back here, guys, what I'm saying is, 
Now, there is such a thing called as learning and the word I like to use and my dear students make a note of this, continuous learning, okay? If you want to be a freelancer, okay, I believe you are there. I see a lot of people coming in in every session live and please understand the only way to have a reasonable, good reputation and make a decent amount of money is through continuous learning. If somebody comes and tells me, Jay, you know what? You're in India, you, 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 you live there, you, be, you, you don't have any other job, you just do freelancing. How did you manage for 11 years and probably for the rest of your life? The one word I'll tell is continuous learning. Every week, every week, I'm always learning something new. And, and I say that with a lot of pride. I don't stop. Every week I'm learning something new. I'm learning something new. For example, that that's that new company I, I just, you know, God's grace, I co-founded that the whole video vendor thing that happened because I've been learning how to produce videos, how to edit videos, how to make videos for many years. Many years I didn't give up. I would watch YouTube videos. I would read books. I would read blogs, how to build the studio at home, how to, what hardware do you need? What kind of camera do you need? So much of homework went into it. So all those years of continuous learning culminating in the YouTube channel. So I would request everybody here, those of you who are serious about freelancing, you must understand the learning thing never stops, at least in a job, okay? You have the employer or employee they will take care of your training. You'll get training. That will happen. But when you are a freelancer, the prerogative to learn things is on you. Okay. And I'll tell you something. The, the whole freelancing industry, you have to understand it's, I'm sorry to say this, but it is a dog eat dog world. Everybody is competing with everybody on price, on references, on, on computing equipment. Like for example, like I have a studio, right? Like so, so I have a dedicated video studio. So how many people in India can have their own studio? Not many. So now when I go into the video vending business, very few people can compete with that, right? So there you go. People are always figuring out better ways to do things. So you, you are, you're literally in a lifelong uh, rat race. Now, some of you might think, wow, that sounds stressful, but I look at it as a way of excitement. You know, when you, when you think of something new, it can be uh, something that gives you tension, something that gives you sleepless nights, or it can be something that gets you excited. Okay, what else is new? What am I gonna do tomorrow? What I'm gonna create next month? Okay, that's the attitude I want you guys to bring in to the table. So that can only happen if you are continuously learning. You may have heard articles, right? Like there are some companies where they have a dedicated one day every week to try new things, to learn new things. I believe in that, okay? So every week, try to learn something new. Five hours, 10 hours, now how do you learn? People ask me always, like, Jay, how do you learn? There's no one specific way. I, I read books, I attend workshops, I attend free programs online. Like for example, Microsoft and Amazon, they conduct free training, okay? And of course, AIU, you know, they conduct free workshops right here. How can I not mention that? So big companies, universities, they're always doing this free training. I'm telling you guys, this is not the old days. So much of training is free. So much of technology is free. And also let's not uh, forget, you know, wherever you live, it doesn't matter which part of the world you are, governments are always providing uh, free learning facilities. So there are always things, the only thing missing is your ability to make time and take advantage of these facilities. So I will request everybody in the session here. So if you are serious about freelancing, you know, building a portfolio, maintaining things and so on, continuous learning, continuous learning. And, and then of course, every time you learn something new, don't forget to add it to your portfolio, okay? So that's the main thing. So you learn, you build. That's why I call this slide, learning and building. Learn, build, learn, build, learn, build. It's an endless cycle, but, but it's kind of like you're building a big mound. You know, like when you go to the ocean or something, you're playing in the beach, you're trying to collect sand and you're trying to push it to the center. The more sand you push, the taller the mound gets. You know, that's how a freelancer becomes better. You know, every week, every month, you're learning something new and your brain is improving. You're getting taller and taller and taller. So when a client meets you, 
he looks at you and he's like, wow, okay, you know a lot of stuff. I like that. I want to work with you. JJ, one thing I want to point out is that when you do a portfolio, there should be one web page that brings it all together so that That's if, right. you're, if you're on YouTube or if you're on Discord, if you're on uh, other sites, you're always linking back to that one like blog, professional blog post so they can always go right. back and, and see everything about you. That's right, Professor uh, Lambert. I'm just going to show that right now, sir. So guys, what Professor Lambert is talking about is, uh, so if I go back here, uh, I, I know, so if I just type out my own website, uh, there you go, guys. So this is my uh, personal website. Now, there you go, guys. This is what I'm talking about. So that's me. Everything I do is in this one single page. So this is what Professor Lambert is talking about. So please make sure that when you start building things, okay, you go ahead and put everything you are doing, like Professor Lambert said, it, it, think of it like a HQ, you know, headquarters or control center. So everything is linked from this one place. So you probably want to mention this on your business card or on your profile and stuff like that. Now, sometimes, okay, now this is a common issue. Sometimes you may not have the money because this thing costs a reasonable amount of money, especially for somebody in India. Now, what I do is I always maintain two websites, okay? Now, one is this website for which I have to pay money, but I imagine a scenario like maybe I'll forget to renew this website or I don't have the money or some people don't have the web money or something. So what I do, guys, is I do a simple but clever thing. On GitHub, believe it or not, they actually have an option to run a free website. You don't have to pay any money for it. So this acts like a backup for my one place. It has everything. It has my Microsoft Award. It has my Upwork stuff. It has my podcast, YouTube channel, blog, everything in one place. And this is free. So if you can figure out, if you're, if you're in the software industry, figure out how to do this, uh, then please, or you can just Google me and come here. I put all the steps here on how to do it. You can check it out, how it works or something like that. So, like Professor said, a website is cool. If you can afford it, build a website of your own. Link everything up so that if your clients can just visit at one place. I, I, I know some people think it's old fashioned, but guys, even today I use a business card because I never know when I meet a client. You know, I'm, I'm sitting there drinking a cup of coffee. I see somebody, I'm like, bro, here, take my business card. You might find something interesting. So always keep business cards in your pocket. You know, like just get them printed, keep it in your uh, you know, a bag or something, you meet somebody, you're traveling, give them your card, they may throw it away, but who knows, they might like, okay, you know, they might need it someday. So a website definitely helps. It, it, it's actually essential. All right, so so go ahead, build a website. If you don't have the money for it, you know, there are many free options. I use GitHub. I also have a paid website. So have both of them. So as you learn, as you build new things, as you do more things, start adding everything to this website and stuff. Uh, Professor, does that sync with what you're trying, what you're, what you're telling me, sir? Does that, does that add up? Absolutely. You nailed it. Okay. 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 So guys, the last topic for the day is, you know, this is something which will keep coming back in other sessions as well. Guys, do not underestimate the power of social media. I cannot stress this enough. Your clients are global. I have no idea where my next client is going to come. You know, once again, I'm sure some people are like, oh, looking sideways or ignoring me about I'm, I'm me starting a new company. But that happened because of YouTube. I had no idea somebody was watching it. Okay, I'm just uploading it and share it on my LinkedIn and Twitter. I'm just writing about it on my blog. I had no clue. Some guy was watching it every week. And then after he saw those videos for three weeks, he just calls up and he's like, bro, I want to uh, you know, take you for a movie. I'm like, why? You know, why all of a sudden a guy asking to watch a movie with me? And then I'm like, sure, why not? You know, I mean, I, yeah, I knew him. I know like from years ago, I just said, hello. I think I shared a business card or something. Yeah, again, business card. See, a business card. So he was watching my uh, social media and YouTube channel and during the movie, He's like, in the, when you're buying something in the, you know, the, 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 the food section, he's like, hey, man, you know what? I liked your video vendor idea. 
I read about in the blog. I saw your YouTube videos. Why don't we team up? I have money to invest. So social media, guys. What am I talking about? Social media, it could be anything. You know, for me, the one that really helps me is LinkedIn. For freelancers, obviously, you know, LinkedIn is the number one social media. That's where all the people are there, both people, clients, or who want services, and people like me who provide services. Very important to maintain an active LinkedIn account. Again, the people have mixed thoughts about Twitter. I don't care about the politics of it. It's a social media, it's popular. Make sure you are on Twitter. Whether you like it or not is irrelevant, guys. Something you like or don't like is not gonna pay your rent. So keep your emotions out of the window. Use what is necessary. Jay, this is something, I, this is a question I wanna ask you. This is, might be a really important question. Okay. Because I remember years ago, I had this friend and she was a hairdresser. So she would cut hair and she didn't have many clients. And then one day she's a, a, a person came from the television station and said, would you like to do some advertising? Sure. So she did like a couple of advertising, like 30 second slots on television. And all of a sudden her business just exploded. She had hundreds of clients coming from everywhere. Is there a way to actually advertise on the internet, on television, on radio to, to do your freelancing? Uh, yeah, of course, Dr. Lambert. So, so th that is an extension of what uh, we are discussing here. I was not going to talk about it, but I do do it sometimes. So I'm going to explain that, Professor. So what happens is once you have a presence on social media, so LinkedIn uh, or, or Twitter and Instagram, I'm not going to underestimate Instagram as well. You know, people think it's for kids. It's actually not for kids. So Instagram, and of course, in the US, you have TikTok. In India, we don't have TikTok, but US and other countries, there is TikTok and things like that. So the professor, once you have a presence in these places, when you have something which is, which you believe in your heart, that is worth something to people, uh, it's very easy, sir. Any account can promote any of their content, sir. So it's just one click. So let's say I have written an article uh, or a video, which I believe is going to change my life. And I have, say, maybe 50 or $100 to spend, and I think it's worth it. Then you, within your account, you just need to uh, go into the ads dashboard. So every account has a built-in ads dashboard, Professor. You simply go ahead and convert your regular post into a promoted advertised post. And they will be shared with, you can choose things like with city, which time, which age group. Uh, I don't think gender is allowed anymore. I think they made it illegal or something. But yeah, like that, you can pick and choose what properties you want to target, what communities you want to target. Uh, and then only those people, like thousands of thousands of people will get to see it, Professor. So yes, sir. So if you believe you have a chance, if, if everybody, like for example, let's say you, like again, the haircut example. So if everybody believes that this lady has good haircut talent, Okay, and then maybe she's like, okay, everybody says it, that I have a good talent. So maybe I'll spend $50 this month and boost or advertise uh, a video of a uh, hair cutting. Uh, same thing I do with my, like recently, Professor, we were trying to hire some employees for our company. And then I had to pay like some $30 or something to boost our job posting. We got like some uh, 150 applicants, Professor. If I didn't boost it, I would have gotten maybe 10 applicants. And and now we have a team of four people working for us. So yes, Professor, so boosting on social media, if, if you, I mean, again, it comes to your heart, Professor. It doesn't, because you you know, you you, you have to understand as a, as a beginning freelancer or anybody actually, they always have a limited advertising budget. So you should be convinced first that you have something worth boosting. So then yes, Professor. So there you go, guys. So please do think about this online social media presence. Now, for me, what is yes, Professor? You're saying something. Oh, just um, from my experience as being in a also an accountant and doing yes, business sir. financial management, is when you're starting out, try and think maybe around twenty to twenty five percent of your expenses should be in advertising, and then once you start to get established, try and bring that down to about five percent of your income. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, so start around 20% advertising and then try to bring that down to 5%. That's a, that's a general rule of thumb for getting into business. 
Okay, there you go, guys. There you go. So when you are starting out, you know, whatever money you can, you know, you have a budget for your freelancing, right? You must, you must have a budget. Uh, so try to divide it, like the professor said in the beginning, maybe 25% every month on advertising. But as the customers flow in, now you have to understand, guys, you know, uh, once you start getting in a, a, a nice flow of customers, they will go and tell people, trust me, they do that. You know, if you can make anybody happy, you know, customers are people as well. They go and tell. So many times I've gotten new customers from existing customers. No advertising, no. I don't even have to ask. You know, they're just like, hey, I know a guy who wants you. That's it. So, so, so that, and, also, and of course, yeah. And, and, and from a personal experience, I want to tell you, I know these days people don't think it's cool, but I get a lot of customers from my blog. I don't know how. I write a blog every week. I think I have an online blog with some 600 post professors. So I write a lot. Do you know how that happens? It's because when they do Google searches, yes. blog, po blog posts tend to come up first. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Guys, even today, you know, don't be fooled that people don't read. People do read. Trust me. Anybody who's trying to spend some money on a service, they'll always want to get the best for their money. Even if they have to spend $5, They'll sit and do the research and nothing impresses people like reading. Okay. I mean, you sure young people, they don't have the attention span, but you have to understand nobody remains young forever. Everybody gets old and then when they get old, they start reading. Okay. So blogging really helps guys. And the best part is now with AI and all, you don't have to do all the writing. You know, I have nothing against AI. So take help from AI, take help or hire a writing freelancer to write. Now you are a freelancer, so maybe you are trying to do like a barber shop or something. Go ahead, get a freelancer to write some articles for you every week. Go ahead, get a, a freelance video guy to make hair cutting videos of 30 seconds every month. You know, upload them on your Insta. So like this, all these things are part of your marketing. Okay. And if you feel that you have something really good, like the professor said, go ahead and boost it. And do not underestimate the power of communities. If you're an artist, join Art Station, Deviant Art. If you're a musician, SoundCloud and Discord. Oh my God, as Professor Lambert says, there are hundreds and hundreds of Discord servers, many of them completely open, filled with people who just want to help. You know, you, people think the internet is toxic. It actually is not toxic. Some places are, but the world is not like some hellish nightmare that you see in the movies. It's actually a good place filled with good people. You just have to find the right places, talk. And you know what, I'll tell you something. So many people, they may have tired or their career is already, like for example, I, like every week, so many people email me and message me. I reply everybody and I don't charge a cent because my life is already established. Thank God for that. So I want to help anywhere I can. So like this, there are a lot of people out there who are in their 40s, 50s, or retired. They already made whatever money they can make. They're just sitting there looking to share their knowledge. So that's what communities do. Discord, DeviantArt, ArtStation, SoundCloud, YouTube, blogs. Oh my God, blogs. People write about everything. You know, things that you had to pay a lot of money 30 years ago. Just sitting there for free. It's amazing, guys. I'm telling you. But again, don't forget. It is still a rat race though. What is free means what you're reading, your competent freelancer is also reading. So, so, so you know, it's, it comes and goes, it's like a balancing thing. Um, so anyway, guys, so that's the time at 8.22. So I'm, I'm supposed to be wrapping up in 45 minutes, but I think I went a little bit. Uh, you know, just, yes, just like in a case of you're of a painter and you think, okay, well, who can, who, who would, who's my market? Well, people who write books and print books need that cover art. So you get yes, into sir. you get into these these groups on on um on the internet like on Discord and all these groups, who of authors and then say okay okay anybody who's printing a book out there I do artwork for your covers. Right. Uh, also, so professor, it's not a bad idea. Uh, one of the things I do so regularly is that I attend these conferences and I attend these real world meetups. So like nothing beats the real world face to face thing. Uh, you know, professor, I do that a lot. Even in a place like India, there are a lot of people organizing these meetups and groups. And I'm sure things like that happen a lot more frequently in Western countries and developed countries and so on and so forth. So go ahead. If you see there's a group of artists meeting up, just go and hang out, talk. 
And one thing, one thing I've taught some other people is that you can do biographies where you go to a family and you want to, you want to write a bi biography about someone who's old in that family and then publish a book about them and then do your artwork on the cover. So you can combine two talents of writing a biography and doing your artwork for the book. And also, Professor, uh, let's not forget the potential of audiobooks. I listen to a lot of audiobooks so because my eyes are not what they used to be. So I, I know as I grow older, I, I find myself listening more than reading. So there you go, Professor. Yeah, yeah. And podcasts. Oh, my God. Podcasts. Yes. Yeah, people who do YouTube content, those content creators, they're always looking for artwork for that page. That little thumbnail so, where they advertise, where you can see that they want something that's going to like be really interesting to look at. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, there's just there's just so many opportunities. You gotta you just get out, get there, look around. You're gonna see all these opportunities you never would have thought of before. Exactly. And, so, and you can combine different talents, and you can combine another one of your talents into your talent, like writing and art, to create books. Of all kinds of different kinds of books, children's books, biographies, it's, the list goes on. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And also, guys, those of you who are watching, if you're in that, if you're thinking, oh, you know, they're just talking, it's not real, uh, don't forget, I'm a full-time freelancer. So the proof is right here. So there's no doubt that whatever we are discussing is not going to happen. So we are talking with proof here, guys. So, guys, that is the end of my 45-minute session. The remaining time is for questions. And if we go beyond the one hour, you know, I, go, I don't mind. So, Professor, go ahead, sir. Any questions? I'm, I'm ready, sir. I'm looking for questions. Uh... Here's a question. An interior designer. Yes, so sir. the person's an interior designer. How would how would how would a person like that actually get into freelancing? Yes, sir. Professor, I actually read an article about this. Interesting you bring it up. There is uh, professor these days there is something called as a, a, a pre -vis. Uh, I'm going to show it to you, sir, uh, on the screen right now. So what a lot of architect folks are doing is because you can't actually go and build a house, professor. It's not practical. So that's not going to happen. So what I saw is, what I found out is there are website professor like this one, sir. There you go, sir. This is called real-time visualization, sir. So what I see a lot of architects are doing is they're using, this is all 3D, professor. None of that is real. So they are using software like these things to build virtual houses. Look at that, Professor. That, none of that is real. So they're all like virtual houses, virtual cities, virtual places. That's a, that's a virtual thing, Professor. That's not a real thing. So what architects are doing is they are using 3D technology to make their vision become a reality. So like that one is not a real house, sir. Twin motion. So those of you who are watching, guys, if you're an architect, um, by now you probably know about this. If you don't know it, this is the time to learn it. So there are a lot of such software professor. Like the one I like is Twin Motion because it is free. And the best part is, sir, there's an option in the software where once you build a house, you can upload it like a video game and you can actually walk through the house right from your smartphone, professor. It's very interesting. I love it. If I was an architect, I would be building houses every week in this 3D thing. And then I'll see why people won't hire me. <laughs> so this is one example, Professor. You, you know, I, I you know I love games, right? Those those role-playing games. Yes, sir. And so there's there's people who create maps. So that there you, you go. Can... Yes, sir. And but and then being able to create a three dimensional map is sort of, is, is like big. Yes, sir. Could you create like that's a exactly map? my point, Professor. You get these things, sir. The, I actually tried this. Uh, you know, I told you, sir, I like to learn things. So I actually tried Twin Motion uh, for a few days and was able to set up some things and things like that. It is possible, Professor. But one thing I will let you know, sir. Like these things are still very much. Uh, the software is free, sir, but the computer and the electricity that you need to run this thing is massive, sir. 
Uh, if you do these things on a daily basis, I remember when I was practicing this in India, electricity is very cheap and still my bill was going up to $100 a month. And that's uh, that's rich people bill in India, sir. Uh, I, in India, electricity is very cheap. Even then I was racking up bills of a thousand, so not thousand dollars, a hundred dollars, sir. It, it was a lot, you know, the, the building guys were actually asking me if I'm doing something illegal or something. <laughs> I had to show them. No, no, guys, I'm just working on some 3D hobby and stuff like that. So there is like a, a professor, I think the word for this is entry barrier. So the thing is, so these things are cool, but like everything else in life, if something is cool, it usually costs a lot of money to uh, do and, and maintain on a regular basis. But yes, sir, if somebody is an architect, this is the place to, and also another one, sir, is SketchUp. I think you heard about it, sir, SketchUp. There you go, sir. Another software with similar goals. Yeah, I used to design beekeeping equipment and beekeeping types of systems yes, to, to, to actually keep bees and produce honey. And I would use SketchUp to create different hive designs. There you go. There you go, sir. So what happens is you can create stuff in SketchUp and then you can transfer them into twin version to make it a real house, like a 3D thing. Yes. Yeah, SketchUp is easy to use. Doesn't take a lot of computer hardware to make it work. Yes, so sir. It, can, it can work on most any computer. And it runs on iPad, so now there's an iPad version. I believe there's an iPad version. There was a little bit of problem in having some of the people who are interested in my designs actually downloading the design and sending that to them. So but now they solved the problem, sir. I think now they've improved their sharing system. So I, I don't think Excellent. that's an issue anymore. Yeah, this uh, was because I was able to import a lot of SketchUp things on the internet directly into twin motion. No problems. It was very oh, easy. Really? Wow. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, they have so made it very sir. The, these days, sir, as you said, you know, a lot of people have realized, I mean, even clients and customers, sir, now they want more varieties, they want more interactivity. So uh, these technology things have become very smooth. Now I, I could say we are living in the golden age of virtual realism right now. I would oh. say we have reached that stage.